Good morning. I welcome you as we gather to worship in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King. I'm glad you're here to join us for worship today. I invite you to stand and welcome those next to you. If you see a father or dad around you, then say a special thank you to them this morning. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. You may be seated. What a joy it is to welcome you here today as we come to worship in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King. I'm glad you're here. I'm Chris. I'm part of the ministry team here at Crossgates. It's always a blessing to be able to welcome you and to join together in worship. There's a connection card that you've been given, and we hope you'll fill that out and let us know of your presence here today. There are a lot of wonderful things you can do with that, including prayer concerns and electronic giving and sharing with us changes of information. But one of the things we hope you'll do this week is that we, this week we will be having our Wednesday night fellowship meal and following that, an opportunity to participate in an art project. We're calling it Dinner and, a, and Canvas. And so we invite you to take part in that. If you're planning to be with us Wednesday night, which you can come for the meal and the fellowship and not do the art, you can come for both the fellowship meal and the art, and you can come for just the art. But we'd like to know if you're going to be present with us, so please indicate that on your card in the comment section that you'll be present Wednesday night for meal or for meal and art or for just the art, and let us know of that um, if you don't mind. Also this week, I shared last time that we, we uh, shift a little bit in the summer, but we don't slow down. Our youth are headed to Big Stuff, their retreat on the beach this week, and so we're excited about them headed there. Also, our adult group is headed to Oxford, Mississippi for a couple of days, and uh, going to have an exciting time visiting some of the sites there as well. Um, and so we have those things going on, and if you're participating in them, we're excited that you will be a part of that. Next uh, Sunday afternoon, there will be a reception for our new and a worship service honoring our new district superintendent, Reverend Dr. Connie Shelton. And we will meet here at the church. We're hosting that event for our district. It actually will begin with a worship service at 2.30 here in the sanctuary. And then we will move back for the reception uh, that will take place that, that later in that afternoon. So all of that information is there on the bulletin for you. Uh, it is at 2.30 that we will begin the worship service. Well, today is Father's Day, and I want to say a great thank you to all the fathers who are with us and honored them. Can you join me in doing that? <clears throat> my children really know their dad, and so I have to just show you my Father's Day present. And I need you to help me if you don't mind. Um, my children are expecting me. How do I do this? It's not going to do like that. Just one second, please. Technical difficulties. My children are expecting me to use my Father's Day present. And so I am going to, to do that for them, if you don't mind helping me. This is called a... Some of you know what this is? Yeah, it's a selfie stick. So I need this section over here now to smile, if you don't mind. All right, how about you? Your turn. All right, over here. Thank y'all so much. My children will be so proud of me. We do honor and give thanks for our dads. That was the good, one of the presents, but the best one was a Persian from Tata Nut in Ocean Springs. We can talk about that later. That's a whole other conversation that needs to take place. Uh, but what a blessing it is to be able to share with our children, with our fathers, and such a blessing to be here. So we give thanks today for them. Um, we also, our hearts, we want to be in prayer for pastors and churches in the United Methodist Church in Mississippi. This is what is officially called Moving Week. 
And today is the first Sunday new pastors will be at the churches in their pulpits and churches will be receiving their new pastors. And it's part of our rhythm and cycle in life together. And I invite you to be in prayer uh, for them uh, as they uh, venture this morning. Uh, also, our hearts and our minds are certainly uh, in grief and in pain for those in Charleston, South Carolina, who were involved in the shooting at the church, Emmanuel AME Church there. And we certainly join the, the world in lifting up the Christian community there. And I just give thanks to God for that church's uh, response in offering grace, hope, and love. And I think we need to be sure we follow through in the same manner. And so we pray for them, and we pray for God to be with them. And in all situations, and Allison will lift up uh, concerns in prayer in just a little bit. But we gather this day to be in God's presence with each other and to seek God's grace and to worship. And so I invite you to stand as we begin our worship together with singing.
into this time of prayer, let us lift up our joys and concerns on our prayer book this day. We lift up Nick Nicholson, Valerie Thornton, for Dorothy Thomas's brother-in-law, Donald Lofton, and her son-in-law, Barry Henry, for Pat Wern, Molly Shepard, Randall Livingston, for Carmen Smith. We lift up Carl's, Carl Tudor's sister, Sandy, for the family of Justin Lander, for the families of Emmanuel AME victims, for Carl Eckhart, Judy Bland, Matthew Wallace. And we rejoice this day for the birth of Stella Campbell Store to Katie and Evan Store. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Think about his love. Almighty God, our faithful Father, we've come into this place to worship and to praise you. We've come to celebrate your mighty acts and to lay a special blessing upon the men in our lives as we celebrate fathers. O oh Lord, for the biological and spiritual fathers who have guided and loved us, we give you thanks. For those separated from their father today from distance or other circumstances, Lord, we ask that you give them your comfort and your strength. For those who have been without a father, we thank you for other men and women who have stepped up in their lives to support them. And our hearts grieve this morning, O oh God, for the amazing men and fathers we have recently lost and those we continue to remember and to mourn. Almighty God, in these moments, we lift up all of these to you and others that we have named aloud. And we lift up our brothers and sisters at Emmanuel and the community of Charleston who are devastated by the deaths of their loved ones and their pastor. And God, we ask for your healing presence in that community to go beyond the boundaries of race and religion, for them to feel your love and your grace as they ask many questions that they may never have answers to. And for the family and friends of the young man whose hate fueled his violent decisions, Lord, we ask that you give them your guidance, your grace, and your love. Lord, help all of us lean on your power, even in the midst of darkness or hatred or fear. For it's in that power that we feel even more when we see your joy and your grace poured out through the birth of Stella Campbell. Lord, we ask that you be with Katie and Evan and her big brother, Finn. We rejoice and celebrate with them on her birth this day. 
God, pour out your strength and your grace on all of us and all of those who have been lifted up. May we feel your strong presence in our lives no matter what we face. We ask all of this, O Lord, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'd now like to invite the children to meet Miss Sherry up front for our children's moment. I know all these kids are having trouble getting, getting going, getting down here this morning because they probably all made breakfast in bed for their fathers this morning. They've been cooking and cleaning up. Is that what you've been doing? Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. It is Father's Day. It's a pretty cool day. Have you already told somebody Happy Father's Day? A dad, a granddad, somebody who maybe is at church that is like a dad to you. I've had lots of those along the way too and it's amazing to have our lives filled with those kinds of people who help us out and help us know to get the right tools for this thing called life. And I think back to the times when I was a little girl and I was a daddy's girl. You know what that means? That means I wanted to be everywhere my daddy was, all the time, doing whatever it was he was doing. If he was going down to the parts store, I wanted to go too. And then I wanted to have a, a bottle of Coke with peanuts in it. If he was working on something, out in the garage or out into the carport I wanted to be right beside him helping him and I'm sure there were times when I wasn't quite as much help as I thought I was but I loved the toolbox that he had and he would be working on something or making something and my job was to go get the right tool for the job anybody else ever help do that your job was to go pick up the tool, bring it back, and hand it over. I felt like a nurse when the doctor says scalpel, and I got to hand it over. So here are some of the tools that I remember my dad using. You ever seen this before? Yes. What is it? You may know? Tape measure. Oh, it's a tape measure. That's exactly right. Very good. My dad used this a lot. His idea was measure twice, cut once. So we measured a lot. What about this one? Does anybody know what? I wasn't sure if you know what this one was. It's a level. That's exactly right. This fascinated me when I was a child because have you ever watched somebody use a level? What does it have in the middle of it? A bubble. And I would keep my eye on that bubble, and my job was to yell out when it was right in the middle so he had it in the right spot. I'm telling you, I was lots of help. Lots of help. There's a level. What about this one? Saw. It's a saw. It's a pretty fierce looking saw. And my dad had one of these too, and he would use this kind of saw. And what's this? Duct tape. Duct tape, yes. We used a good bit of duct tape too, because every now and then the measure twice cut once didn't work so great. And we needed a little help putting it all back together. But I loved watching my dad with his toolbox and help him with the tools. And do you know that it's pretty cool that God, our Heavenly Father, who is 
all of our Father gives us some tools, tools that dads and moms and our spiritual dads and moms that help us out at church can help us get into our toolbox along the way so that we have all the tools to be equipped for life. And a measure, ooh, my tape measure, if we're using that toolbox idea, what does God give us to measure decisions we should make in life? Tape measure? It's like a tape measure, but what does he give us to use? Hands. He does give us hands. What do we read to find out what we should do? What God wants us to do? Which book? Say it loud, Maggie. The Bible. Yes. The Bible has been given to us in our toolbox as a tape measure for us to measure up the standard that God wants us to live our lives by and to continue to strive toward. The level, I'm just going to tell you, if you don't get things straight the first time, can it be kind of rough? Have you ever made a choice that you wish you'd made a different choice afterwards? And if we'd use the level, which once again, our parents, their wisdom, their help for us, guided by the Bible, helps us take the straight and level path in our lives. Now, let's do the duck, t no, let's do the saw. The saw, I know none of you has ever tried to touch the little teeth on that saw, right? Because it is sharp. It's sharp. That's right. It'll saw right through some wood. Shark's teeth are sharp, too. And this kind of looks like shark's teeth, doesn't it, on the end of that saw. But you know what moms and dads sometimes have to help us do? They sometimes have to help us cut out things that we shouldn't have in our lives, like a bad attitude. Has your parent ever helped you cut out a bad attitude? Mm. or to cut out bad habits that we have in our lives or that they see won't be up to that measure that God wants for us for our lives. So they can help us cut things out that don't need to be there. But then they also can be like duct tape because they can help us to remember what's most important and what we should stick to in this life. Yeah. Stick to. Duct tape's pretty sticky stuff. And, and our parents use that measure of the Bible and that relationship with God to help us remember to stay stuck to God and to stay stuck to family because that's what actually matters the most when we put it all together. So as you build your toolbox, as you go through life, I want you to always remember who helped you Get your toolbox together. And that dad, that mom, that spiritual dad at church, and our Heavenly Father has provided the perfect toolbox for us. Your brother has a toolbox? Cool. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the fact that you equip us. You give us all the tools we need to be a part of your work in this kingdom. Help us to know you, to have the tools, use the tools, so that we are ready to say yes anytime you need an assistant to use these tools. In your name we pray. Amen. You may rejoin your parents. Today's offertory is offered in honor of all fathers. And we give thanks for that gift to us today. Ushers, please come forward.
Good morning. Today's scripture is out of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Goliath challenges the Israelites. Verse 1. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Sakah and Judea and Azkah and Epsdamon. On verses 4 through 11, then Goliath, the Philistine, champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was a giant of a man, measuring over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and a coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leggings, and he slung a bronze javelin over his back. The shaft of his spear was a heavy and thick weaver's beam. He tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. An armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a huge seal, shield. Goliath stood and shouted across to the Israelites, Do you need a whole army to settle this? Choose someone to fight for you, and I will represent the Philistines. We will settle this dispute in single combat. If your man is able to kill me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Send me a man who will fight with me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Verses 19 through 23. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army of the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts. He arrived at the outskirts of camp just as the Israelite army was leaving the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistines forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, he saw Goliath, the champion from Gath, come out from the Philistine ranks, shouting his challenge to the army of Israel. Verses 32 through 49. David kills Goliath. Don't worry about a thing, David told Saul. I'll go fight this Philistine. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There is no way that you can go against this Philistine. You're only a boy, and he has been in the army since he was a boy. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and take the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the claws of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented, all right, go ahead. And may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, he strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like. He had never worn such a thing before. I can't, I can't go in this, he protested. I'm not used to them, so he took it off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across to fight Goliath. Goliath walked toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David shouted and replied, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you. I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God of Israel. And everyone will know that the Lord does not need weapons to rescue his people. 
In his battle, not ours, the Lord will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it from his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face downward to the ground. Will you join me as we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word, the stories of our faith, many that we remember from childhood. And we give you thanks for this opportunity to share it anew. Lord, be with us and speak to us. Speak through me and help me to say what you once said. We pray it in the strong name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, oftentimes preachers don't venture in to the Old Testament text, but for this next season during the summer, I'm suggesting we follow the story of one of the characters in the Old Testament. One of those that we find to be a hero, but one we also find to be very, very human. I'm, I'm excited about it. Just ask the staff. I've been talking about this for a few weeks now and how excited I am to begin this series with you, to talk about those people of the Old Testament that we revere and that we hold up on a pedestal, but who when we really begin to look at in their story in the Scripture, we find that they're very real people. The Old Testament is important for us as we see God's relationship with the people of faith and how God journeyed with his people from creation to the time when he came himself on earth and offered himself on a cross for humankind's redemption. And so he promised to be with us always from then. But it's neat for us to venture back. So to set the stage for where we are and what Trish read for us, which we gave her a lot of verses, and we made her skip around. So uh, I've got to kind of bring you up to task on where things are. The children of Israel, after they had been in slavery and in bondage in Egypt, journeyed, as we know, through the wilderness for a long, long time with Moses. And it came the day that God allowed them to enter into the promised land, all but Moses and his generation, and they began to cross over. And a leader named Joshua led them through the waters of the Jordan River and into the promised land. As they began to settle and as they began to find life there and as they began to, to, begin to have crops and, and herds and began to settle the land and live off of it as God had promised, they also began to need a form of, of leadership that would carry them through this season. And so the groups called the judges came up and they would listen to people's understandings, complaints against each other. It was relatively a peaceful time, but the judges ruled over Israel. Around the nation there, the tribes that had dispersed and settled, there was the need then that the Philistines began to bring their armies closer and closer to try to take their property. And so Israel cried out for a king. And this story in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and first and second kings helps us see the kings of Israel, which were very few. And so here's a person. There's some characters you have to know. Man, this is as fun as kind of like one of those television reality shows or one of those ongoing series that you kind of get involved in. You, you have to kind of know some of these characters. And this, this is what excites me because every time I look at these characters, I see their counterparts living today in some ways as we as we kind of embrace them and so we see them going into the the promised land and as they're there they continue their worship of God and there are priests that are there as well there are still God's prophets who speak there's still those people who hear God's call in a special way to be the people they've called Samuel was one of those Samuel was born of Hannah and Hannah was not unable to have children for a long time but when she did have a child she offered him to be live in the temple and to work in the temple with the priest Eli and so he stayed there his growing up years Samuel Samuel was a priest Samuel was a prophet Samuel became one of the last judges to rule over Israel 
And so this wonderful character named Samuel, who we know is in touch with God, he's the one who was lying down at night and heard a voice and thought it was Eli calling him. You remember that story? There's just too much for me to get into to tell you all the details. You just got to go back to the first part of Samuel. Um, and he said, kept going back and saying, here I am, Lord, you called. And Eli would say, it wasn't me, go back and sleep. And about the third time he said, when you hear the voice again, say, here I am, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. And God spoke a word to Samuel. So God was strongly at work in Samuel's life and worked through Samuel. When the people of Israel rose up and decided they needed a king to lead them, specifically to lead them in battle against the Philistines, and so that they would be like other countries who were of prestige and had kings that, that ruled over them, Samuel was the one who heard the voice of God say, Go to Saul, the great warrior, and anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. And Samuel did just that. And Saul arose as the king, and he began to do battle with the Philistines, and he began to pull the nation together in a monarchy so that he was the ruler. Saul comes on the scene. And Saul is this interesting character. It, it wasn't long until God realized that Saul was just a little too cray-cray to be a king. You all understand that terminology? He was a little too out there. He was a little too crazy. He really didn't get what God was trying to do. And so God on, on the down low, on the DL, goes to Samuel and says, Samuel, I see Saul here, but he's not going to be king forever, and I don't trust his sons. So what I need for you to do is go anoint a new king for Israel who will come to reign later. And so Samuel listens and said, God, do you really know what you're asking me to do? And so, yes, I do. He said, well, go to Bethlehem and there gather the, the, the sons of Jesse. And I will tell you which one to anoint. He said, so what am I going to do, Lord, if Saul finds out and has me killed? He said, just take a heifer with you and say you're going to offer a sacrifice. It sounds like our world, doesn't it? Little... Uh, under the radar, kind of not truly honest with what he was doing, but yet following God's command. And so he goes and he offers his sacrifice and he calls for the sons of Jesse, which there were eight uh, sons of Jesse. And each one came and, and each time Samuel would say, gosh, I think this is the one. This is the one that looks like a king. This is the one who I think acts like a king. And every time God said, no, no, no. And he got to the end and God was still saying, no. And so Samuel asked Jesse, are there any more sons? He said, yes, there's the youngest son who's out tending sheep. But he is so young, he can't even come in for the sacrifice. And Samuel said, go get him. And as soon as David, a ruddy young man, handsome, who had been tending the sheep, came in, Samuel knew that this was the one that God had chosen. And so he anointed David, a child, to be the king. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. <laughs> See me later. I know, it's a, it's a whirlwind gig. See me later, man. This is the same kid that shared the most favorite prayer I have now after Bible school, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, Samuel, Saul, David, Jesse, all eight sons. See, I told you it took something to bring it in. This is why I get excited because it's so interwoven and so intriguing. Uh, and, and these people are just like us, Saul, who's crazy. So after that experience happens, and David is the anointed king, he goes on his way knowing it's not his time, but Saul is still reigning. And in the midst of Saul's time of reigning, with the deal with the Philistines and everything going on, he begins to have nightmares. And he begins to be disturbed in his spirit, in his soul, the scriptures say. A little bit of mental illness probably begins to show in Saul's life here. 
and he begins to not be able to truly function but his sons aren't either so they look for someone who can soothe the spirit of Saul and so they find this young harp player lyre player who comes in and plays the harp and Saul asked his father Jesse if David could stay with him so that when he was tormented he could hear him play See? David's not king yet though he's anointed king but the next move we see is he's coming in to soothe the spirit that's been disturbed in Saul the scene then shifts to the passage we have today and there is David who is back tending sheep with his father whose three older brothers had been a part of the people's army who had gathered to go fight the Philistines with Saul who were at the battlefront and David is, is told to go and to take care of the sons that are there Jesse's a neat character and what we kind of grasp from Jesse is he is a faithful servant of God he is someone who is obedient not only to God but to the kings and who is faithful to offer his children in the service of the Lord and his country and whatever is needed and so here we come to the place another sighting of the to be king David and the already king Saul and as David arrives to the battlefield to do his menial duties of carrying supplies to his brothers to be sure they had what they needed, he hears, sees the battlefront and hears what is going on with this giant of a man named Goliath. Now most people when they're measuring the statures that are listed here put Goliath to be somewhere close to nine feet tall legendary proportions for a common Israelite in that day who would have been in the middle 5 6 to 5 8 stature someone 6 9 or 6 10 would have been a giant and the armor he had and the intrigue that he called about and the ways that he intimidated the soldiers David arrives on the battle scene and sees Goliath very confident in who he was. And he looks to his brothers and the others who constitute the Israelite army. And because he hears what is said and does, sees what is done, he is incensed because Goliath offers threat against the army of the living God. And he's also incensed because the Israelites are so timid that they will not stand up on God's behalf. And so David begins to do what he can do. The key about David is not that he was so self-confident he would take on a giant. The key of David is, is that he recognized who God was and what God would do in this situation and became obedient to God. David and Saul have this interesting interaction as if they had never met before. And at the end of the story, Saul is asking who he is. That's why I'm thinking, Saul, maybe, I mean, this is the dude that's been playing. You didn't, you sleep at night, dude. You know what I'm saying? You don't know who this is? But the battle takes place. David stands up on behalf of God. In his own way, with a slingshot and five stones, takes down the giant who has been intimidating the armies of the living God. There are kind of two directions my message was going from there. One was experiencing all of this week has kind of led me in some places. Uh, I am intrigued by basketball, you know that. So you know that last Sunday evening I was watching as Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers were geared to do Game 5. And after Game 5, I'm all this time rolling David and Goliath in the back of my head. And, and after Game 5, the, the post-game interviews happen. And I'm thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Wait a minute. That's almost Goliath-like. Did y'all hear it? The interview? Well, let's just see. You feel a lot less pressure this finals run just because you are undermanned and you had some injuries uh, as opposed to previous years? Nah. I feel confident because I'm the best player in the world. It's simple. It's simple. I feel confident because I'm the best player in the world. Goliath-like, right? It's all on me. I think that after game six, he would thought Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving may be important. Okay? And I'm not hating on anybody. I'm just playing you an interview. So it was intriguing to me to continue to watch the battle. (laughs) And on Tuesday night, when all was said and done, and the Golden State Warriors, interesting name for my whole scenario of what's taking place, I know. When the Golden State Warriors and Steph Curry and Andre Iguodala, yeah, you don't know that name, do you? He was the MVP of the tournament, by the way. I was intrigued by the post-game interview. You saw it too, right? You saw Andre Agadow receiving the trophy. Well, here, let's just watch it. Thank you. It could have been a lot of these guys, but there can only be one MVP. And this year's MVP is a player who didn't start in a single game until these finals. This year's Bill Russell MVP, Andre Iguodala. They were in Cleveland, by the way. That's why the booze. Andre, the commissioner just mentioned it. 758 straight games in your career, you started. In what way did your sacrifice of coming off the bench embody the spirit of this entire group? Um. We got a team full of believers. We all go to chapel before every game. We all believe and we all say God has a a, a way for you, a purpose for you. This is my purpose and I accepted it and I got great teammates. Steph, I want to be just like Steph when I grow up. Just a God-fearing man. I think that's what was happening with David and Goliath. David in his own, Goliath in his own strength, in his own way, knew he could make it happen. I couldn't script this stuff, by the way, that all this happened this week. David, on the other hand, understood his purpose. And he understood the God who could work through him. And the God that could win this battle because he was the living God. Too often we still rely on our own instincts, our own abilities and leave God out of our lives. And sometimes we allow the giants to overcome us and to intimidate us because we don't really understand the God who's living and who gives us purpose. When we're fighting the battles with giants, it's God who gives us the strength to win. And it's God that walks with us through And it's God that gives us the strength to be the person he's called us to be and to be victorious. That's one place my mind went this week. And then I began to think about the whole interesting dynamics that transpired over Wednesday night when a young man comes into a church and sits through a Bible study and then takes out his pistol and kills people in the church itself. And I began to wonder, what is it that we're instilling in our children? As we gather on Father's Day and we talk about great fathers like Jesse who obviously had instilled respect and hard work and obedience and loyalty to God 
and the understanding of God's strength and will that persevere. What, what are we teaching our children? And oftentimes we again and again see disrespect and skepticism, prejudice, and hate. A self-centeredness that pushes us to do things that we would never do. The comment that, that got me the most was when the young man had said that he sat through the Bible study and almost decided not to do it. I wondered if the church had loved just a little more. Could they have even changed a hardened heart like that? I've been amazed at the response of the church. I've turned off all the news networks who are trying to put their own political spin and agenda on everything that's happened there. Yes, the young man was not mentally stable. Yes, he was filled with hatred. And yes, he did and cause, intend to cause an act of terror. We don't have to choose one of those. It all happened. But the key is, is how the church and the families have responded to know the living God who even in the midst of that situation conquers giants and offers forgiveness and hope and love. If we're ever going to persevere against the giants of this world, it will be because we understand who the living God is and we love like the living God and we teach our children that respect and justice and for doing the hard work of love is what's important. God walks with us even with crazy people like Saul, and we'll find out David's not beyond his reproach either later on, but that God is in the midst of who we are and brings us life. And when we trust in him, he helps us know our purpose and live into that purpose and conquer giants. Will you join me as we pray? God, in the midst of our world, it still challenges you. And it still, in confidence, antagonizes your people. In a world where there's still hate and pain and sorrow. In a world where we struggle not to be so self-centered that we can't see the good in others. We pray that we will know our purpose and that you will help us live for you who is the living God and that you will help us do the hard work, the hard work that you began on the cross of redemption, of hope, because of your love for us. Help us as your people to truly live into who we are. And God, be with us, even in the hard times. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, and guide our hearts and our lives. For we pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is Rejoice the Lord is King. I invite you to stand as you're able and as we respond to God to sing together this hymn.
serve the living God, who find hope and peace, and are able to go forth empowered to share His Word in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.